Yesterday I beat Pokemon Emerald with Waylord, so today, fittingly, I must beat the game with Relicanth. These are the rules for the run, now let's get right into it. As a kid, this thing only stood out to me because it was rare to find and you needed it to unlock the Regis. As I've grown older and played more and more Pokemon, I still have never used one of these on my team. First of all, there are other water rock types which I much prefer, for example Kabutops or Omastar. And secondly, when I'm doing casual playthroughs, I don't really like to use Pokemon that don't evolve. In most cases, they feel fairly strong when you first pick them up, but then they fall off by the time you're facing the hardest trainers in the game. It's also worth noting on Route 124 and 126 where you find Relicanth, the encounter table has only three Pokemon. There's a 30% chance to find a Chinchou, a 60 5% chance to find a clam pearl and only a 5% chance for this cool ancient fish to show up. I'm sure for a lot of you, after you found so many clam pearl and chinchow, you just gave up on your searches in these locations and never even turned up a relicanth. And if you did, and decided to add it onto your team, well, it's not really that great of a Pokemon. For base stats, it has 100 HP, 90 attack, and 130 defense. Okay, so these stats are pretty good, but unfortunately, it only has 45 special attack, 65 special defense, and 55 speed. From generation 1 until generation 3, all water type moves deal special damage, which is Relicanth's weakest stat, and the rock type moves that it gains access to are, uh, they're, they're not very good. At level 15, it gets a Rock Tomb, which has base 50 power in Generation 3 and only 80% accuracy. But don't worry, once this slow growth rate Pokemon levels up to 43, it gets access to Ancient Power, improving upon its base power by 10 points and its accuracy by 20%. Now the Omni Boost is fantastic, but it's not really something you like to rely on. Note on the right hand side of the screen, I am displaying Relicant's full moveset, and you will note that there are a bunch of tutor moves included here. One of them is Rock Slide, which has a base power of 75 and 90% accuracy. If I was playing Fire Red and Leaf Green, then I would have access to this move as soon as I reached Rock Tunnel. However, in Emerald, the Rock Slide move tutor is only available once you beat the League, and even then you need to spend BP to purchase the move. Because this is a solo challenge and my primary metric for evaluating a Pokemon's performance is real time, I will not have access to this powerful rock type move today. As you'll know, I manipulate my starters to give the Pokemon the best possible chance to beat the game, so today I assigned Relicanth Hidden Power Rock to give it access to a more powerful same type attack bonus move. In addition to this, it will get some other fantastic moves, for example, Yawn at level 22, Rest at level 50, Calm Mind once I access the TM by defeating Tate and Liza, Ice Beam from the abandoned ship, Earthquake just before the conclusion of the plotline, and then of course Surf after I defeat Norman. Now because of its incredibly low special attack and the fact that I likely will be using Surf as well as Ice Beam for the majority of this run, I decided to give Relicanth a rash nature, boosting its special attack and lowering its special defense. You might think that lowering my physical defense would be a better idea, but I wanted to keep that as high as possible just because Steven is the last battle in the game and generally he is quite difficult. Lowering my special defense will leave me more vulnerable to grass and electric type moves, but the first of these two types does 4 times damage anyways, so I figure that if I get hit by something like Giga Drain, I'm just going to faint. On the other hand, Watson could be more challenging because of this nature, but that's a problem I'm going to have to sort out in a little bit. I am also doing two playthroughs in Emerald nowadays, so because of that, if I have made a nature mistake, I can just correct it later. The last thing that I had to decide on for Relicanth was which ability it is going to utilize. It has access to both Swift Swim as well as Rock Head. The first of these doubles Relicanth's speed stat when Rain is on the field, and the latter prevents all recoil damage. This might be useful because the fish gets access to takedown as well as double edge, but both of these moves are not really that good. Takedown has low accuracy, and double edge comes quite late in the playthrough at level 57. At that point, I think that other options will be better, specifically special moves in combination with Calm Mind. For that reason, I decided to go with Swift Swim because this could help my speed, especially against Wallace. After all, Relicanth will take neutral damage from water type moves because it does 
have the rock type. Okay, so it's time to talk about my early game strategy. I fight nearly every trainer up until the Rustboro City Gym. The reason I did this is because of Relicanth's slow growth rate. By the time I've defeated every gym trainer, it's only level 12. That said, I can rely on Water Gun for her rock types, so I'm pretty sure that Relicanth is going to be able to win now. Roxanne's first two Pokemon are Geodude, and they take four times damage from Water Gun, so even though my special attack is very low, I'm able to polish them off with a single hit each. However, that's when the spree ends because the Nose Pass has really high special defense. Also, it's holding an Orenberry, and she has two potions, so she's gonna be able to heal it a lot. That said, after it lowers my speed once with Rock Tomb, it is no longer going to use the same type attack bonus move because it sees that it's faster. That's beneficial to me because the the rock type does not actually resist itself, so I would be taking more damage from Rock Tomb, but because the AI views that move as a speed control move, now the Nose Pass is choosing between Block, Harden, and Tackle, of which two do not deal any damage, and Tackle is resisted. Finishing off her ace might take time, but at least it's straightforward. With this victory, I gain a 10% boost to my attack stats, so at least Tackle's going to be doing a little bit more damage. And then when Relicanth reaches level 15, it learns Rock Tomb. I have definitely complained about this move in the past, and it is really painful when a Pokemon has to rely on it. And for Relicanth, it does make sense for this now to be my go-to move, despite how painful the accuracy is going to be. My fish is quite slow, so I stop by the train school to talk to the teacher who gives me the quick claw. I haven't used this item nearly as much in Generation 3 as I do in Generation 2, but it might be a little bit useful today with Relicanth. For a little bit more experience just south of the city, I take on the rival, and here I'm going to be using Rock Tomb against his Trico just so that it doesn't get in multiple absorbs. However, it doesn't appear that he has an AI script because the Trico just goes for pound against my Rock type and I knock it out in two hits. Across the water in Duford Town, I pick up the Silk Scarf, which allows me to boost the power of normal type moves, however I still think utilizing the Quick Claw makes more sense right now. After delivering the letter to Steven Stone, I decide to not face Brawly. I think that he would be far too challenging for Relicanth. After all, it's pretty underleveled at only 16 right now. Instead, on Slateport Beach and inside of the little beach house, I can grind against a bunch of trainers, leveling it up more. The ways that I can gain experience continue because I can face the Team Aqua Grunts inside of the museum, and then head north of the city to fight more trainers. Okay, so remember in the Waylord video when I fought Lass Robin and had significant problems because of the Shroomish, which knows Leech seed. Yeah, I defeat her Skitty, then the Shroomish comes out. My Rock Tomb does hit, but the Grass type survives on red health. It retaliates with Stun Spore, paralyzing me. This drops my speed, allowing it to move first, setting up Leech Seed. Paralysis prevents my attacks. It starts using Absorb, and I'm not even able to finish it off. Relicanth faints, and that's my first reset. Immediately following this fight, I wrote a message to Serena, my artist, and commissioned trainer art for Last Robin because I think she has earned it. This battle, of course, is technically optional, but I do like to complete this area of the game just to get access to one rare candy. I'm thinking that in this playthrough it might be useful if I have to train for Watson, because grinding past level 30 can take a long time, especially when you have a bad growth rate. Luckily in my second attempt I managed to defeat her and move on with the run. Fighting more trainers outside of the trick house, I level up to 22, and here Relicanth can learn Yawn. This move inflicts sleep, but it does it over two turns, so it's not as good is something like Sleep Powder, but I think that it could be useful against Watson because his Pokemon like to spend their first turn in battle paralyzing you with Thunder Wave. I teach it to Relicanth in the place of Harden because that move isn't useful until the late game of Pokemon Emerald. With my training in this area complete, I now have to face the rival. His first Pokemon is Slugma, which is obviously not very good, so I just take it out and move on to the Grovile. Now here I decided to go for Yawn, but Absorb gets a critical hit, taking Relicanth down to red health. And because I'm not faster than the grass type, I have a loss on the next turn. I tried again, this time the Slugma survives, uses its own yawn, and Relicanth falls asleep by the time the Grovile comes out, so that is another reset. This was really not looking good, so I decided to battle some wild Pokemon and level up to 23. After that, I backtrack to Duford Island and fight all the trainers in the gym. While they do specialize in the fighting type, my Relicanth is overleveled enough to make quick work of all of their team members. To prevent backtracking, let's face Brawly now, because I think I will be able to pull it off. 
Up first is Machop, I go for Water Gun, get a critical hit, and finish his lead in only one turn. Next is Metatite, I once again score a critical hit with Water Gun, and his second Pokemon faints. Alright, things are going very well so far. Last is his level 19 Makuhita. I use Water Gun, which scores a third critical hit in a row. However, this fighting type has enough bulk to survive. It uses bulk up and then heals itself with a Citrus Berry, so my next Water Gun is not able to get the knockout. While I am able to take it down to low health, Brawly heals it with a Super Potion, giving it more time in battle. I bring it back down to red health, and then it goes for Reverse and polishes Relicanth off. I lost that battle after the ridiculous crit spree that I got. I am not sure if I'm going to be able to do this. Wait, that's not true. There is a better option on the table for me. I can two-shot the Machop and then two-shot the Metatite, moving on to the Makuhita very consistently. Here, if I choose Yawn on the first turn, then his fighting type will fall asleep and be less likely to hit with Reversal when it's at low health. By doing this, I'm able to defeat him on my next attempt, and then I have to head back to face the rival again. At this higher level, I'm able to one-shot the Slugma so that it can't use Yawn to put me to sleep, and Rock Tomb does massive damage to the Grovile, but it just barely hangs on. Granted, Absorb does half, which is not enough for it to heal out of KO range. With an accurate Rock Tomb, it faints, and I clean up his final Wingull. Surrounding Mauville City is a massive density of optional battles. I I am going to take part in most of these, skipping only some where Grass-type Pokémon are involved. During these battles at level 29, my Relicanth learns Takedown in the place of Tackle, and then once finishing all of the trainers in the gym, my Water type is level 31. I had to hope that this was a high enough level to defeat Watson, because if I have to resort to training, it's going to be wild Pokémon from here. So can the Prehistoric Fish defeat the Electric-type Specialist? Let's see. His lead is Voltorb, and my Relicanth outspeeds, going first with Rock Tomb, finishing the Pokeball off in a single turn. Next is Electric, its ability is static, but Rock Tomb does not make contact, so I can knock it out without a risk of getting paralyzed. But that is where that ends, because the Magneton and the Manectric are going to be able to paralyze Relicanth, utilizing Thunder Wave. However, I have a Cherry Berry to counter the first time that they do this. Instead, Watson's Ace decides to set up with Howl right away, and then he Heal health with a Citrus Berry. I really wish it hadn't, because I think I would have knocked it out on the next turn with another Rock Tomb. Well, that would be if I didn't miss. This move is so frustrating. Manectric paralyzes Relicanth, my Cherry Berry cures the status condition, and Rock Tomb misses again. After that Shockwave critical hits, Relicanth survives, gets a critical hit Rock Tomb, and finishes Watson's Ace off. He did keep his Magneton benched though, so when it comes out, that's that. In the next battle with better Rock Tomb Lock, I'm able to defeat the Manectric and move on to the Steel type with green health. Because it resists both Rock Tomb and Takedown, I'm going to be using Water Gun here. This is another reason my boosted special attack is helpful. Turn 1, Magneton goes for Paralysis. I do about a third. Then I take it down to yellow health. It uses Shockwave, taking Relicanth down to 5 hit points, and I get one more Water Gun in, finishing Watson off. It only took two battles. I think when I went into this playthrough, I underestimated this fish. Whenever my expectations for a Pokemon are extremely low, I tend to come out of the playthrough surprised and feeling quite good. If, for example, my expectations are too high with a Pokemon like Seal, and then the playthrough ends up being quite painful, then I usually feel very dejected after the run. With a third badge obtained, I now have a badge boost for Relicanth's speed stat, and that is really going to help in the next section of the game. Plus, the prospects look very good for the next two gym leaders, maybe even the next three. After all, the water rock typing is probably one of the best typings against Flannery, and the rock type is definitely one of the best against Norman. After him, my rock type has a good advantage against Winona, so maybe Relicanth can continue its momentum. On the route heading north, I pick up the team TM for secret power. It is important to do this because then the TM shop spawns in Slateport City, where I'm later going to be able to buy hidden power. I wasn't sure if maybe I should teach secret power, after all it is a little bit more consistent than takedown despite having 20 less base power. In the end, I decided to not waste time with new moves, so now let's head up Mount Chimney and face Maxi.
This fight is pretty straightforward. The Mighty Anna lowers my attack, which is annoying, and then it also gets a sand attack off. But once it's defeated, I have four times damage against the camera up, which gets completely obliterated by Water Gun, and all that remains after that is a Zubat. And of course, it's not a particularly potent foe. With the meteorite in hand, I backtrack to Fall Arbor Town and exchange it for the TM for return. Teaching this normal move in the place of takedown will give me a much more consistent option that it only has six less effective power. With that update made, I head to Laveridge Town to face Flannery. Her first Pokemon is Nummel, it goes down to Water Gun, what would you expect? Next is Slugma, and I critical hit, so yeah, it's gone as well. Camerupt is the same story as the Nummel, so now she only has Torkoal left. Don't worry, it has decent defensive stats, so my water gun only does half. This gives it time to set up Sunny Day, which cuts the power of my water type move in half. That said, it still does decent damage, and I think I'll finish off her ace in two more hits. She buys some time with a Hyper Potion, and this is pretty annoying, but the Torkoal really doesn't like to use Overheat because it lowers its special attack. Instead, it usually just attacks with Body Slam until it sees an opening, but of course this normal move does almost nothing to Relicanth. As a result of this, she just doesn't have anything, and Relicanth wins. Backtracking through the center of the map, I pick up a rare candy in the desert, and then I pass through Mauville City, heading south to Slateport City first before backtracking to Petalburg. The reason I did this is so that I can buy the TM for Hidden Power, which I mentioned before, because I want to give Relicant the better same type attack bonus move. Hidden Power's base power is determined by Relicant's IVs, and in this case it is 70. So with the same type attack bonus, its effective power will be 105 and that is significantly more physical damage when compared with a move like Return. Now I caught an Abra early on in this playthrough, so I can use it to teleport back to Mauville City, saving a little bit of backtracking time, and then I'm going to head through the middle of the map to go back to Petalburg City. While I do this, I want to talk about a quirky interaction with Hidden Power and the move Counter. Because Hidden Power is defined as a normal type move in the ROM, the game assumes that it deals physical damage because all normal type moves do that. However, Hidden Power is different. Depending on what type it is, it deals either physical or special damage. This is going to be really confusing for you if you play later generation games where Hidden Power is always special. In this case, it can be either or. However, when the game calculates the damage that Counter deals, it assumes that because of Hidden Power's normal Normal typing on the ROM, it deals physical damage, and because of that it allows it to be countered even if its typing deals special damage. So in the later generation game, Hidden Power Rock would deal special damage, but in this game it deals physical damage, but that is irrelevant, either way counter would be able to counter it. The reason I'm explaining this now is just so we really understand the interaction that my Relicanth is going to have against Norman's slacking. After all, it really likes to use counter. I grab myself the White Herb, backtrack through the forest, and then I'm ready to take on the normal type specialist. For this battle, I'm utilizing a Person Berry. Now, I do think that I could have gone to the Move Reminder and taught Harden in the place of Yawn, giving me a chance to set up against his Spinda. But since I didn't do that, I just have to knock it out right away. Hidden Power gets the job done, and then he sends in Slacking. And you know how I just made a big speech about how I shouldn't use Hidden Power against this thing? Yeah, I click slightly too fast, use it, and as predicted, Slacking counters it, dealing massive damage to Relicanth. I begin playing safer from here, alternating between Hidden Power and Water Gun. The slacking cannot counter my water type move, and I decided to use Yawn after that because putting this thing to sleep really hurts it, after all it only attacks every other turn. Unfortunately for me though, I uh, once again use Hidden Power, the slacking counters it, knocking Relicanth out. This has to be one of the more embarrassing fights that I have had in modern times. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. Anyways, let's do it again, knock out the Spinda, this time I'll use Yawn first turn against the slacking, faint attack does a little bit of damage, and then once his ace goes to sleep I can use hidden power to knock it out. From there all I have to do is clean up, and with that I have earned myself the 5th badge and a 10% boost to my defense stat.
This win also massively upgrades the moves available to Relicanth because I get the HM for Surf, which of course I'm going to teach right away in the place of Water Gun. Utilizing this field move, I can journey to the abandoned ship and pick up the TM for Ice Beam, which I teach in the place of Yawn. Defeating the Team Aqua members in the Weather Institute means that I am given Cast Form, which is holding the Mystic Water, further improving the damage of Surf. Ice Beam coverage gives me an easy answer for Grovile on the Rivals team. Well, that's what I expected, but because of Relicant's low special attack, which has not been boosted yet, I just barely don't get the one hit. It chooses Leaf Blade, and the damage from this powerful grass type move one hits even though Relicant had full health. Okay, so maybe that's a better damage range, and I might be able to one-hit the Grovile. This time, I just get a critical hit, and for now, I'm gonna take that. Inside the Fortree City Gym, I level up and can teach Relicanth Ancient Power. I took this move just because sometimes it can be good to get through a tight squeeze if you get an Omni Boost here or there. Granted, I am not going to need it against Winona, because she is a flying-type specialist, and I have all the coverage I could ever ask for against her. Swablu is first, I figured Ancient Power would be enough and maybe give me an Omni Boost, but no, of course I don't get it. Ice Beam does 4 times damage, one-shotting the Tropius, and while it probably would have done the same thing to the Altaria, I was a little bit worried that it was going to survive one hit, so I decided to two-shot with Ancient Power, just for more of a chance to Omni Boost. In the end it doesn't happen, but that is of no consequence. The Skarmory, which is usually tanky, takes tons of damage from Surf, and the final Pelipper is only a troll that likes to waste time. I pick up three rare candies on the next routes, and then I head into Lily Cove City, where I fight the rival outside of the department store. Upon initiating this battle, I immediately regretted my choice, because once again I'm going to have to knock out the Grovile in one hit. Please say that Ice Beam is going to do enough damage, and in this case, it does. I am so lucky that he doesn't evolve his starter into Sceptile, because that would have been really bad. Also, it was always such a letdown for me as a kid when the rival never faced you with his fully evolved starter. To me, it always felt like these games were incomplete just because I never got that experience. I'm really glad in the remakes that they added in a final battle with the rival after the league. For story purposes, I think that that works really well. The Magma Hideout is next, I crush Maxi in here, he is not a threat at all, and Matt is a similar story in the Team Aqua Hideout. Next is Shoal Cave, which I explore so I can obtain the rare candy the Never Melt Ice, as well as the Shell Bell. I follow my typical routing next, heading to Pacific Log Town to grab the rare candy just west on the Rapids. I have sort of made a trilogy of videos, Claydol, Whale Lord, and now Relicanth, and I wanted to mention the locations where all of the Regis were obtained one by one. Unfortunately, in none of these playthroughs do I go onto the route where Reggie Ice can be obtained. You find it just north of Duford Town on the water route, and yes, technically I take the boat through there in every one of these playthroughs, Throughs. I probably should have mentioned it then. Anyways, that's where you obtain Reggie Ice. It definitely has the worst of the puzzles. You just have to sit in the little chamber for a certain amount of time, and then the door unlocks. Also, Editor Scott here. I do want to mention the fact that I'm pronouncing it Reggie Ice, which makes a lot more sense when compared with Reggie Rock and Reggie Steel, but I do now know that it is pronounced Reg Ice, which has caused me so many problems recording audio this week. Why, Pokemon, do we have to have this weird asymmetry? Okay, let's get back to the playthrough. In the Moss Deep City Gym, my Relicanth is going to make it to level 53 before the 7th Gym Battle. Do remember that against Tate and Liza, I have to have an HM user on my party, and Surf's damage is going to be halved as long as they have two Pokemon on the field. Because of this, I figured that the fight would take some time, so I wanted to prepare for that, and I teach Relicanth Rest in the place of Hidden Power. I also give it a Chesto Berry, just so it's going to wake up right away after healing. I don't want to spend too many turns asleep, giving their team members time to set up with Calm Mind, or the Soul Rock time to use Solar Beam. I anticipate that this is going to be the hardest gym battle yet. They lead with a Zatu and a Clay Doll. I go for Surf, which just doesn't do half the ground type, and that's 
pretty alarming. After all, they have four hyper potions between the two of them. As a result, I am not able to knock out either of their first two Pokemon before Relicanth faints. For the next battle, I come in with the Mystic Water, hoping to improve Surf's damage and get a two hit on the Claydol. I also wanted to adjust my strategy just slightly and knock the Zatu out right away, utilizing Ancient Power. This does work out. However, then once the Soul Rock comes in, I am still not doing enough to knock the Claydol out, and eventually I have to use Rest to heal, which doesn't go well because I can't wake up right away. I attempted the fight for a third time because as a slow growth rate Pokemon, I don't want to use my rare candies right now. There was also a small part of me that was really hoping that when I one-shot the Zatu, I could get an Omni Boost. This would improve Surf's damage by a lot, giving me a guaranteed two hit on the Claydol and potentially two hits on their other two rock types. But I think fishing for this 10% chance is not the best way to play. After my third loss, I backtrack to Fall Arbor Town to talk to the move reminder, and I am going to teach Relicanth Harden. Remember when I said this move was useful in the late game? Apparently it might be useful before or Steven, which I never would have guessed. My strategy here was to set up using Harden so that Claydol's Earthquakes deal less damage every turn. The problem with this strategy is once the Claydol realizes that I'm doing this, it's just going to use Psychic, and this also gives Zatu time to set up with Calm Mind. This reduces the damage that the bird takes from Ice Beam, so Relicanth essentially becomes quite useless. I take it back, Harden is in fact not useful here. To save Save as much time as is possible, I think that I should use Rare Candies now. I've accumulated a total of 13, so I can bring Relicanth up from level 53 to level 66 before attempting the fight again. And uh, even at this significantly higher level, I am still not able to defeat Tate and Liza. That is because I was going for Surf right away, that's obviously not the right choice. What I need to do is use Hidden Power on the Zatu, finish it off, and then spam Surf. By doing this, I can finally defeat them and earn myself the seventh badge. With it comes a 10% boost to my special attack and special defense. But more importantly, they also gave me the TM for Calm Mind. This has to be one of the best setup moves in the entire game. It boosts both your special attack and your special defense. So of course, what did I do next? I completely forgot that it existed and continued to play the game with Relicanth's current set. With Surf, I didn't need an immediate upgrade though because Maxi and Tabitha are a double battle in the space center and I can easily manage them. Before fighting Archie and concluding the plotline, I pick up the TM for Earthquake, which I'll save for later. The Team Aqua boss is no threat to my overleveled fish. Then Rayquaza comes in, saves the day, and I have a chance to go up against the final gym leader, Juan. I think this fight would have been very simple, utilizing a Person Berry, allowing me to set up against the Love Disk with Calm Mind. The majority of his Pokemon do resist Surf and Ice Beam, but still, once Relicanth gets to plus 6, it would be doing good damage. Don't worry, in my next attempt I am going to play with that strategy, so we will get to see how it goes. That said, even just using the moves I have now, Relicanth is able to defeat Juan because, after all, it is overleveled. Before going to Victory Road and facing Wally, I'm going to backtrack to Fort Tree City because now I can use Waterfall outside of battle. On Route 119, I can then scale this waterfall, use the Acrobike across these little ledges, and pick up an additional rare candy. I also head back to Fall Arbor Town and pick up the rare candy at the top of the waterfall there. Of course, obtaining this one on the way to Steven's Stone is a little bit more efficient, but I wanted to have these available to me during the league just in case I need a couple more levels. Wally is easy to defeat despite some misplays that I make against his Magneton, and then I pass through Victory Road to the Elite Four. Sydney is up first, Mightyena goes down to a single hit from Surf, and Ice Beam manages both the Cacturn and the Shift Tree. Next, he sends in Absol, and this one does survive. He heals it a bit, but in the end, it is kind of irrelevant, and I move on to his final Pokemon, Crawdont. Its best move is usually Strength or Facade, because it loves a turn one setup with Swords Dance, which it does do here, but obviously that is irrelevant, because I'm a Rock-type and I resist its physical moves. 
Phoebe is next, and this is the first fight where having Calm Mind would definitely make a difference. Then I wouldn't have required the critical hit to knock out her first Dusclops, and her second Bayonet would have been knocked out right away. Due to another critical hit, I take out her second Dusclops in two hits, and against the second Bayonet, I roll better damage, finishing it in only one hit. Last is Sableye, but Relicanth gets a critical hit. Yesterday against Glacia, I had a lot of problems with the Whale Lord, but I don't think that'll be the case for Relicanth because Hidden Power Rock is super effective against her ice types. It smashes through her Celio in one hit. Next, she sends in Wall Rain, which just barely hangs on. It goes for Surf in Retaliation, which is neutral, but it doesn't do very much. As a result, I'm able to take it out over two more turns, and then I sweep both Glalie and the final Celio all in single hits. And yeah, the spree continues because Drake's next, and if you have access to an ice move, obviously he's an easy sweep. While watching the footage play out, I want to mention speed stats in Pokemon Emerald, because once you make it to the late game, most of the enemy Pokemon you face are not particularly fast. To be specific, on Sydney's team his Shiftree is his fastest Pokemon with 105 speed. Phoebe's team is overall slower with her second Bayonet, having 91 speed, and Glacia is still slower than Sydney, with her fastest Pokemon being her second Glalie with only 103 speed. Drake is the first trainer with a Pokemon faster than Sydney's shift tree, and he actually has four. Altaria, Kingdra, Flygon, and Salamence. Altaria has 107, Kingdra 111, Flygon 126, and Salamence 132. Now of course my Relicanth is over leveled, we need to consider that. We also need to consider the fact that the enemy does not get EVs, and my Relicanth has been accumulating some speed EVs throughout this playthrough. Plus, it has a speed badge boost from Watson's badge, boosting this stat by 10%. Now, I'm a slow growth rate, and I have utilized my rare candies, but even then, my slow fish, which has a base speed of 55, is faster than all of Drake's dragons. Over the last two years, I have not been utilizing speed-lowering natures as much as I should be. Typically, when I consider lowering my speed, I am thinking about this fight, but now that I'm playing a decently slow Pokemon here, I don't think that I need to give give Drake too much credit. In the coming days, I will work on my logic behind my speed stats so that I can know that I'll outspeed Drake's Pokemon if that is required. After all, going for a speed-lowering nature can really improve other aspects of the playthrough, like my survivability against moves that hit particularly hard. With the Dragon Trainer finished off, now let's proceed and face the champion. First of all, um, Wallace's fastest Pokemon is his Tentacruel, which has 118 speed. His Milotic is just slightly slower than this, with 116, and then again the Gyarados with 113. So I'm faster than everything here, but the Waylord sets up Rain Dance, so once again I am even faster. Unfortunately for me though, the Whiskash ends up being a little bit of a problem after I get hit by Gyarados's Intimidate. Despite freezing it, I do have a reset, because it sets up Amnesia and then Surf and Ice Beam are doing so little. That's when I realized I can teach Relicanth Calm Mind, so I come into the battle, set up with this powerful move, and then I go to town sweeping Wallace's team. Waylord goes down, Gyarados falls to Ice Beam, Whiskash to Surf. Luckily, I am faster than the Ludicolo, so it doesn't get a chance for four times damage with Giga Drain. I polish it off, move on to the Tentacruel, which has massive special defense. Of course, I do not one-shot, but it doesn't really matter. While I'm poisoned, I'm able to use Rest to heal on my Lodic, and then defeat it with two more Surfs. This gives Relicanth a Wallace split of 1 hour 57 minutes and 27 seconds, with 14 resets at level 71, with a game time of 7 hours and 10 minutes. But the game's not over yet, so let's prepare for Steven Stone. Of course, I'm going to grab the leftovers, then I use the move reminder to teach Relicanth Harden in the place of Ice Beam. My former experience with water types like Whale Lord has proven to me that I don't need another attacking move other than Surf, and having this setup with both Calm Mind and Harden is going to be of great advantage.
I start the fight off by setting up Harden against the Skarmory so that Relicanth takes less damage from each one of its Steel Wings. The Leftovers provides a little bit of healing passively so that I can set up for a longer period of time. It also helps to mitigate some risk factors like the occasional critical hit, and it's also better than the Shell Bell here because it heals every turn, even when I'm using moves like Calm Mind, Harden, and Rest. And the last of these I do need to mention because the Skarmory loves to use Toxic, so having Rest on my set means I don't need an item like the Petcha Berry, allowing me to use a more impactful item like Leftovers. Finally, Calm Mind lets me set up my special attack and special defense. This means Surf is going to hit all of his Pokemon in incredibly hard, and I am also shoring up my defenses against Cradley, which does have 4 times damage with Giga Drain. It takes a while, but I get set up. With plus 6 in my special stats and plus 5 in my defense, I knock the Skarmory out using Surf and move on to the remainder of Steven's team. Now I've talked about speed stats during the league, and one of the fastest Pokemon in the entire game is Claydol, with 140 speed. In this case though, Relicanth is faster by 3 points, so I knock it out in one hit. Next is Agron, of course Surf gets the job done, Cradley follows, and Surf continues to one-shot. Okay, I was thinking that maybe his ace Metagross would survive, but it doesn't, leading to his Armaldo, which is easily washed away. This was an incredibly easy final battle, and Relicanth clocks in with its final first playthrough time of 2 hours 1 minute and 53 seconds, with 14 resets at level 72, with a game time of 7 hours and 28 minutes. These real-time results are faster than Claydol's first playthrough and slower than Xplouds. However, it wasn't able to get under the 2-hour threshold, so it earns itself a placement at the top of the B tier. Now, because of its slow growth rate, Relicanth did not perform nearly as well in the game time category. With a final result of 7 hours and 28 minutes, it is just a little bit slower than Flygon and significantly faster than Breloom. However, this grass fighting type is going to perform a lot better once I do a second run with it. And speaking of second playthroughs, when I filmed Relicanths, I forgot to turn on the source in OBS that captures my game, so I just had an overlay with all my moves and the time and nothing to show you. So of course I had to come back and do a third playthrough. And footage from that run is what we're watching now. The additional experience isn't a bad thing though, because I was able to explore different natures with Relicanth. In my second playthrough, I went with a lonely nature to boost its attack stat and lower its defense stat. I thought that this would be better for the majority of the run since I am heavily relying on Hidden Power Rock. Then, once I obtain Calm Mind, I make the switch to special moves, and because of my setup, I probably won't need a higher stat. In the end, this didn't turn out to be the right choice, and I switched to a mild nature, so I'm boosting my special attack and lowering my physical defense. Because Relicanth can relearn Harden, I don't need physical defenses for Steven Stone. However, a slightly higher special attack does ensure that with plus 6, I get certain damage ranges. I can't believe I'm saying that, but I actually need a special attack boosting nature in order to one-shot Wallace's Ludicolo. Yeah, once again this thing caused some problems. I also did consider a speed-lowering nature, but Relicanth's base 55 speed puts it in the category where it is just fast enough than pretty much every Pokemon in the game. This data is helpful because it's starting to push me towards some insight to what the speed-lowering nature threshold might be if I still want to move first against the majority of enemy Pokemon. Right now, I am assuming that this is somewhere around 65 or 70, maybe a little bit higher up to something like 75. After all, just last week with Claydol, who has 75 speed, I was able to move first against every Pokemon in the game with great ease, and it definitely finished the game with excess speed. In the early game with Relicanth, things are very straightforward until last Robin. Yes, once again, she is problematic, although this time she doesn't defeat me, I just barely scrape through with only 7 hit points. As I did before, I backed to Brawly, this does cause one reset, but overall I think this is the better play so that Relicanth is at a higher level to face the rival. Against him, I do not have a reset, and then I proceed into Mauville City. In the surrounding regions, I face pretty much every trainer, including the Wind Straits. It's a bit risky because one of them has a Roselia, but a Cherry Berry to heal Paralysis can really improve my odds. This training brings Relicanth up to level 30 to face Watson, and this fight largely comes down to luck. 
Missing with Rock Tomb or being fully paralyzed are the ways in which Relicanth can lose. Today, I only have one reset before I defeat him. In the subsequent areas of the game, I'm going to fight significantly less trainers now than I did before. I have answers for every remaining gym leader in the game, so spending time grinding is not going to be an effective strategy until the enemy Pokemon are at higher levels. This time around, I do teach Secret Power in the place of Takedown, and then I crush Flannery as well as Norman. I'm really glad that I got this chance against slacking to redeem myself for my former terrible play. The rival before Fort Tree City is a very interesting case to examine the implications of natures. With a mild nature boosting my special attack, I thought that Ice Beam would get the one hit on the Grovile, but it just barely doesn't. It would also be remiss of me to not mention the fact that Relicamp has 67 speed and the Grovile has 69. This is not nice for me, and I probably should have trained one or two more levels to ensure that I had the outspeed here. That said, in the first playthrough I had a nature that lowered my special defense and I was unable to survive Leaf Blades, but now I can. While I have one reset here because I'm choosing Ice Beam, in the next fight I decided to go with Hidden Power since Relicanth's physical attack is so much higher, and of course the rock move gets the knockout. If this damage range is possible without an attack boosting nature, I think there is a case to be made that the attack boosting nature overall is not as beneficial as the special attack boosting nature. Because as I mentioned before, the latter of these does make a material impact against Wallace. Skipping ahead to Tate and Liza, here I am taking a little bit of a gamble with Relicanth. Doing significantly less training in the mid game has given me an incredibly good real time, but this comes with a downside because now my Relicanth is level 58 instead of 66. And this is after using my rare candies. Still, leveling up more is not going to dramatically change the outcome of this battle. What I am looking for is the Soul Rock to use Solar Beam instead of choosing Sunny Day. If it goes for the former of these, moves, it charges up, and then a two-shot utilizing Surf. But if it goes for the latter, then it cuts the power of Surf, survives my hit, and attacks with Solar Beam. If we're being extremely detail-oriented, I think my special defense being higher due to my nature is actually a detriment here because the Soul Rock sees a worse damage range when choosing Solar Beam. As a result, I believe that it's going to be slightly more likely for it to choose Sunny Day in this instance. I hope that over the coming year, we are going to get some more tools that will give us more objective data when considering which moves the AI is going to choose in which situation. Situations. At some point we will have a tool that can do this in real time, but right now it doesn't exist. Because of the gamble here, I have a total of three resets, and then I defeat them. My former approach here would have been to just grind up to a higher level to make the battle more consistent, but with a slow growth rate, that approach is more often than not going to take more time. The obvious choice after this is to teach Calm Mind in the place of Hidden Power Rock, and then ride through the rest of the playthrough on the backs of Surf and Ice Beam. So let's watch the Juan fight with Surf, and uh, yeah, after I set up to plus 6, I can just sweep his entire team. I have Ice Beam for the Kingdra, and it one hits. Before progressing to the League, I scour the region for additional rare candies, and this includes me journeying into Shoal Cave. In the past, whenever I would do this, I would pick up all the items required to assemble the Shell Bell, but that I think is a mistake. While the Shell Bell is decent recovery throughout the League, the leftovers significantly outperform it in the battle against Steven. And against nearly every Elite Four member, there is generally a better held item. The default for Sydney is the White Herb, but today his Intimidate is not a problem because I have Calm Mind. Phoebe's next, and this one is a little bit more complicated for Relicanth. The first Dustclops knows Curse, and with just one Calm Mind, I can't knock it out, meaning that it can use this status inflicting move. If it does, I will not have the sustain I need to win the fight. In retrospect, I think it would be possible to play around this status condition with a Chesto Berry in combination with Rest. That way on the first Dustclops, I can set up twice and then hopefully sweep all of her remaining team members in one hit each, utilizing rest once to recover health. In this case, I'm not doing that, I'm just spamming Calm Mind twice. When I have plus two, then I know I can knock the Dustclops out in a single hit, and from there I sweep her team. Doing this, I get a total of two quick resets, and then I move on to Glacia. You might think that without Hidden Power Rock, Relicanth would struggle here. After all, Waylord really did when it wasn't utilizing Rollout. But for Relicanth, this fight really isn't an issue. The reasons Waylord struggled were it didn't have access to Calm Mind, so it was unable to set up its special attack, 
and deal significant damage with resisted moves. Also, Wailord's physical defense is just terrible when compared with Relicanth's, and that is a major advantage here because a move like Explosion just wouldn't hit hard. After that, I defeat Drake, and I do want to note, I am a lower level now, so I am not faster than both the Flygon and the Salamence. However, both of them do not have intimidating moves. The Flygon does have Earthquake, which obviously gets the same type of attack bonus, but look at how much it does, roughly one third. And please do remember that my nature is mild, so my defense stat has been dropped. Following that Kingdra does cause some problems, almost knocking Relicanth out, but because of my Citrus Berry, I'm able to survive Salamence's next attack on one hit point. This gives me time to utilize Rest, and from there, once I wake up, I knock Salamence out. My goal here was to be level 65 after defeating Drake, but I'm just barely not there. In the end, it doesn't really make a material difference. I'm still going to use my Rare Candies now to boost Relicanth up to level 67 before facing Wallace. And yeah, this fight is really straightforward. Just set up with Calm Mind, use Rest if you get hit by Toxic, and then sweep through his team utilizing Surf or Ice Beam. After that, I prepare for Steven in the same way I did before, and I utilize the exact same set against him, although I am at a lower level. The thing is, a higher level will not improve things because I can just rely on setup to get the damage ranges that are needed. I do want to note that I fail to knock out the Cradily in a single hit, and even with its 4 times damage with Giga Drain, Calm Mind is so good that I can utilize rest here to heal, stall it out for a little bit, and then finish it off utilizing Surf. After that, the Metagross and the Armaldo go down, giving Relicanth its final time of 1 hour 40 minutes and 12 seconds, with 8 resets at level 69 and a game time of 6 hours and 18 minutes. Austin helped me out a little bit in working out this run, although he ended up with a completely different strategy than mine, which you might prefer. It utilizes Substitute against Steven in the place of Rest. Stylistically, I prefer the healing move, although Substitute also blocks Toxic, so it's a great solution against the Skarmory. I figured that I would take a little bit of time and describe how Austin and I work together, as well as showing you some chat logs so you can see how it all goes down behind the scenes. First of all, I will report in with my first playthrough results and mention some anecdotal evidence from the run, like for example the fact that Swift Swim seemed unnecessary. Then Austin asked a clarifying question, which is what level did I need for Watson. I said roughly 30, but I got lucky. I made a quick summary of all my post playthrough notes. There was a little bit of back and forth between the two of us, and then he did his first playthrough and reported those results to me. After his first run, he was thinking that this Pokemon could do around 145 for a final time maybe 140. With my final result, I was able to get this 140 time. That said, I think Relicanth can get its time into the 130s, maybe 135 in ideal circumstances with no resets or blackouts. That said, it was able to get a time under 1 hour and 45 minutes, which Waylord did not, so today Relicanth is the first member of the D tier. The weekend of content is not done though, because tomorrow I have a special video for all of you. I'm sure you can make some assumptions about what it's going to be. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much, it means the world to me. And now, if you have made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.